a, a gentleman in Greece named Aristotle uh, talked about this in the fourth century BC, uh, saying that in order to get to new ideas, you had to have conversations. My name's Katrina. And I'm Steve. And we are curious about how changing conversations can change organizations. Yeah, and together with our community of transformation nerds, we're exploring how to leverage conversations to make our workplaces more fit for humans, but also more fit for the future. We'll use our podcast series to do just that, while being in conversation with business and thought leaders who have interesting perspectives on the topic. So without further ado, let's start the conversation. Professor Roger Martin is a writer, strategy advisor, and in 2017 was named the number one management thinker in the world. He is also former dean and institute director of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the Rotman School of Management and the University of Toronto in Canada. He's written a number of books. His newest book is Where More Is Not Better, Overcoming America's Obsession with Economic Efficiency. And his previous 11 books, I'm not going to list them all, but the one that's inspired you the most, Steve, I think, is the, is Playing to Win, which came out in 2014. He's written 28 Harvard Business Review articles. Huge welcome to you. Roger. Oh, thanks. Today's podcast episode will have a specific edge also compared to some of the others that, that we are um, putting out. And this one has more of an edge of strategy and strategy execution and the intersection of that with conversations. Um, so what we'd, what we'd really like to do here is get concrete on maybe a specific case where we can explore the conversations that happened before and then the intervention, and then how the conversations resulted on the other side. Um, and before zooming out and, and just kind of discussing it this more generally, how does that sound for you? Works for me. I'm okay. Super. Okay, we've just done a big intro with, with many things that you've done, but what else should we know about you as we go into this conversation? Well, I guess... I've sort of dedicated a career because I like it to helping people drop and cease using models for their behavior, uh, what they're doing that don't get them the results that they want and, and pick up models that do. Because what I've noticed is that often when people fall in love with a model, here's how to do this thing. Um, when it doesn't work for them, they often do more of it harder. Uh, and I often say, well, why don't you ask the question, was that a bad model in the, in the first place? Oh, I love that. <laughs> do you? I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just zooming out and trying to see something differently so that you can do something differently. Yes. Our starting point, I think, should be here, Steve, because I think you've mentioned this thought maybe three, four or more times to me <laughs> about having read this book several times and seen something new. So playing to win and your experience, could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, it's it's uh, one of my, it is my favorite strategy book, no doubt. And I've read it three times. And the uh, first time I read it, I fell in love with the simplicity of the five questions that you have to answer uh, in in doing a strategy. And I thought the book was all about that. And then I applied it for some years in different cases. And then I came to realize that the beauty of the book was actually um, that it helped me think about strategy as imagining the future. So it was a very creative process of, of imagining the future. And then I thought the book was all about that. And then I re actually reread it uh, only three months ago because I was doing a, 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 a project. And I, I realized that really the book is about uh, changing conversations or, 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 or thinking about strategy as a conversation. And it's a beautiful case of 
Um, in this case, Roger and A.G. Laffley, in my view, identifying a broken conversation uh, that needed to change for them to get to where they wanted to go. And it just changed my view on the book, and I just thought, wow, there's something powerful about conversations in this context. Did you see that from the start, Roger? Are we just catching up with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's a... There's a bit of that, which is which is that the stuff we put in the book on changing the conversation at P&G, we put in because we felt it was important. But I don't think we emphasized it as much. And so I can well imagine that Stieg would have focused on other things and many other readers focused on other things and only came back to see that as more uh, central. That that resonates uh, with me because we didn't say upfront strategies about conversations. But it, it, it is something that is, that is pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, though I got to say, as with most kind of new interesting thoughts it isn't right <laughs> a, a gentleman in greece named aristotle uh talked about this in the fourth century bc uh saying that in order to get to new ideas you had to have conversations uh the the, the book although they didn't actually write books then they wrote stuff that got compiled into book is called rhetoric uh and which now sort of has a bad meaning people talk about empty rhetoric as sort of just arguing for the arguing sake not uh, aristotle did not see it that way he saw the conversation between people is what helped kind of bring to the fore the best idea the most compelling argument for creating something that we do not now have it wasn't this solo a uh, kind of expedition where somebody thinks in his or her own head uh, kind of whoa what what could we do that's different that's better than uh, than now he he didn't believe that he believed it was the back and forth where i say to you caterino well, well what about this we could do this now here's here's my here's my argument for why that that would be a good idea and you would come back and say well yes but what about this roger how could we do it this way or not and then we'd to go talk to steve and 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 he, he add his add his voice to it and in the end we'd come up with a joint view of what's compelling enough to try right because trying something new that is not easy for anybody uh, to do so it has to be compelling enough to be motivated enough to try and aristotle felt that that was a product of conversation mm. It occurred to me, though, that we should probably say the five questions out loud because <laughs> there might be somebody listening <clears throat> who doesn't know what those questions are. Um, w would you do the honors, <laughs> sure. Roger? <laughs> sure. So, I, so what we say in, in playing the way, AG and I say that there are these five questions that have to be answered together and fit and reinforce one another. The first is, what is our winning aspiration? Second is, where are we going to play? Where on the potential playing field will we choose to plop ourselves down? How will we win where we've chosen to play? How will we, will we create a better value equation for the customers than our competitors? Then what capabilities must we have in place to win where we've chosen to play to win, meet our winning aspiration? And finally, what are the enabling management systems that will, ena will enable the building and maintenance of those capabilities that will enable us to win where we've chosen to play to meet our winning aspiration. Now, I've been a little bit pedantic in, in repeating that chain, but I am because they have to fit together and reinforce one another. I, a strategy could be done by any reasonably smart 11-year-old uh, if, if you could do one box at a time. What makes strategy a little bit harder, although I never want to claim that it's super hard, I've tried to make strategy uh, kind of uh, simplified enough that, that any, anybody who works hard at it can, can do it. But the hard thing is those things have to fit together. And the beautiful thing about it being a question is that that invites for a different conversation. It is an invitation to, to, to a real conversation. And I think it's nice that, uh, it's beautiful that that's the way it comes out because that invitation does something also to an organization that we are we're looking at a question that we together need to figure out. Q 
Could you, could you, um, in the case of just leveraging um, Procter and Gamble, mm. could you, could you say what was the conversation that was broken there that needs to, needed to be fixed? You have you've used one of the, my favorite um, terms, uh, this a corporate theater <laughs> thing, yeah. which I think is uh, something everybody knows what it is, but it's everywhere. Yeah. Nevertheless, but could which conversation was broken? Well, it was the conversation between people who headed up the businesses at Procter Gamble. So they have these hair care, laundry care, home care, baby care, etc. And those presidents are running multi-billion-dollar businesses. And once a year, they would come forward to the 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 sort of the head office group, the CEO, the CFO, the head of uh, R and D, <clears throat> to present their strategy uh, and it was a day-long uh, session so you'd say lots and lots of time for conversation right I got a whole a whole day but what would happen is the group let's just say baby care so baby care you know pampers uh, 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 diapers etc they would come forward uh, and they would have worked for months and months and months uh hundreds of person hours thousands of person hours probably to put together a slide deck which they would present for hours on uh, on end and there was even a even a a habit of creating little slide loops three four five loop slides that anticipated any question that might be asked and said well funny you should ask <laughs> and, and then whoosh, you whip out that that uh, that presentation and and go through it so even though notionally this was about the business unit president having a conversation with the CEO and whoever the CEO's uh, kind of most senior colleagues uh, responsible for guiding the overall overall corporation, there was no effective conversation. It was broadcast. It was it was theater, and what was supposed to happen in the th in, in the theater is we do our lines because we practice them. We've gone through the presentation a million times. We practice them. We do our lines, and what was expected back was was something relatively pro forma. Either oh, isn't that lovely? Or I have this question. Ah, funny you should ask. Slide loop. This question. Funny you should ask. Slide loop. None of those are really a conversation. Right? It's not a desire to hear on the part of, in this case, baby care, right? It's a desire to make sure your point of view prevails. So that, that was the problem. The problem was you had a bunch of exceedingly intelligent people at corporate head, uh, head office, including the CEO, uh, who were put in a position of adding zero value. And if they tried to add zero value or more than zero value, right, by saying, well, I like what you've done, but have you ever thought about maybe trying this? The answer would be, yes, we thought about that and we will dismiss mm. it, whether, whether, or not, mm. whether or not that is that is true. So, so you spend a day essentially having no added value through a conversation uh, and in fact, you could have you could have just sent them the sent them the mm. the deck and and your and your talking talking points and and that was that. So we we just said, well, that's a waste of uh, a waste of time. And I did a did, did a funny you'll like this a funny uh, kind of analysis of it. I interviewed the six or so people who, from 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 corporate to say what do you think about the process, uh, and I viewed uh, interviewed the dozen or so business unit presidents and say what do they think about the process, and uh, the business the business uh, unit presidents said, well, we we kind of hate it because we do all of this work and all they kind of do is ask these nitpicky kind of questions uh and uh, all we try to do is get in and get out uh, but because being you know, proctor people are very dutiful they were saying but it seems to be valuable to them and so we're okay with it i go talk to the to the six uh the senior people and they say well we hate it they, they, you know they come in and they know they don't want uh, us to say anything other than oh isn't that lovely uh, and so there's no real useful uh, interaction but they seem to get a whole lot out of having done the work and and, and preparing for it so so 
were okay because it makes them feel good. So it was. What, what about <laughs> what, what? What did you then? Uh, what was the conversation you then installed? What was was the, the design of, of of a conversation that that they needed? Well, what 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 we did is is we we said, hey, you know, do your do your uh, slide deck, uh, but send it to us a week in advance of the meeting. Um, we AG with with uh, with my uh, us working on together would issue them three to five, and it was usually three kind of interesting questions that we thought were worth were worth discussing in the meeting, uh, and that's what the meeting was going to be about. They should assume that we'd have absorbed their their uh, slide deck, and we wanted to talk about those those three questions, and we forbade them from coming into the meeting with more than three new pages of material total. Uh, now, in the first year we did it, they came with like lots and lots of material trying to definitively answer the questions, right? To make sure there wasn't a conversation, they had a definitive answer to the, the questions. And we had to insist, no, sorry, this is going to be a conversation. And they mainly insisted in the first year, can't we just do a quick run through of our presentation, uh, the the presentation? And we said, no, we've we've read it all. We've read it already. We're, you know, we're, you know, reasonably smart enough to read your stuff. And, you know, if your stuff is thorough, we'll read it and it's, and it's, and it's clear. And so we had to fight back this tendency to keep with the, with the theater, but we made it a day of intense conversation about these questions. It was, you know, the smartest strategist in Procter and Gamble, A.G. Laffley, having, kind of saying, gee, I'd, I'd like to, Think about think about this with you, smart person on 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 diapers. So so so, what does it take for a leader to hold space for that conversation? Because I've seen similar conversations where they very easily, with good intentions, turn into a little bit of a policing exercise. Yeah. So so, what are the capabilities and the mindset of leaders to hold space for that conversation? Well. The, the the main thing is is I don't know if mindset is exactly the right word. Uh, Steve, you can uh, I'll explain what I mean, and then you can mm. tell me what how what mm. you would mm. describe it as. But uh, it's harder for some uh, one kind of leader than than the other. So I I generally see in this respect two kinds of leaders. There are set piece leaders. And the set piece leader you would know because they want everything to be like a Shakespearean play, right? Which is everybody knows their lines in advance. They all give their lines, and at the end you have you have a result that was predetermined. It's not unlike international diplomacy, right? When 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 the you know, president of the U.S. meets the president of China, and then they have a like last press conference. It's not as as though voila, look what we came up with during this. All the diplomats worked on everything in the background, and the final communique is written before the plane ever after, ever left the the U.S. for China or or vice versa. There are CEOs who love life to be that way. Um, they f- typically find this. Uh, one, uh, scary, two, kind of impossible, and three, uh, having no merits whatsoever. The other kind of CEO is the read and react uh, CEO who who just want to get in, get into something, hear what's going on, uh, and and then r- read what's going on and, and react accordingly, take the conversation wherever it goes. They have no preconceived idea of where it will end up at the start of the conversation. AG is got zero genes of, of, of set piece uh, and is 100% uh, read and react. So this was perfect for his his personality. Mm. I guess mindset too, but it's sort of, you see mm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. sort of partially mm-hmm. mindset, but partially just sort of inherent uh, personality. Now I try to encourage set piece CEOs to give read and react a try because there are there are just unfortunately terrible consequences of set piece yeah. CEOs right everybody's on edge all the time <gasps> am i saying my lines right oh i forgot my lines i mean uh, you know mm-hmm. it, 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 everything is stilted you do not have any conversations there there like there are no conversations when you go to see a hamlet right the, the, pe- people can't freelance and come up with something in the middle. There are the lines, and you say the lines, and you fall, and you die, or you you kill someone, or or uh, uh, or, or or the like. Um, so it's more that. 
Stieg. It's it's yeah, convincing, yeah, yeah. convincing a CEO of the great benefits of as you you use the term yourself, leaving space for conversation, as opposed to taking up all the space with something that's set piece. We talked about this in in in, in another conversation. This thing about making friends with the unknown. Mm. Oh, that's good. I like that. So so this thing about can you actually be in a conversation where you enter it and you can be okay with the fact that I don't have the answer, and and and. Uh, many leaders, myself included, uh, fall into the trap sometimes of thinking that I should have the answer to everything. Therefore, I'm too fast at labeling things. I'm too fast at mm. in my in my thinking and 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 and, and my choice making. Whereas, so so does it resonate with uh, make yeah, yeah. friends with the unknown? What, what yeah. do you think when I say no, that? No, no, I like that. I, I, I it. I like it a lot. It's very it's very I- I- evocative. Um, and and I and I do think. Um, that for me, the, for me, the key is being exhilarated by that possibility, mm. uh, right? It's just being curious. You know, if if we open that door, that everybody says, do not, do not open that door. Mm. Do do not open that door. It's never been opened, uh, and Lord knows what will happen. Uh, life as we know it on the planet may end if you open that door. Instead of saying, hey man, if we open that door, we might find something. Kind of it, like really cool it makes behind me, there. It makes me think about something. Yes. This thing about, uh, we have this saying where we say, uh, we shape our conversations and then they end up shaping us. Yes. The same goes for organizations, by the way, that they are shaped by the conversations they have, but also by the conversations they won't have. Yes. So, yes. so, so in most organizations I can think of, there are certain conversations that they simply won't have. Yes. What do you think about? Oh I no, I, I I think I think so, and I and I believe uh, uh, somebody can fact check me on this. I believe that was first said about architecture. We shape our buildings, yes, and then their buildings shape us. Uh, they they make us more formal, or they make mm-hmm. us more informal, uh, uh, collaborative. Um, so I, I I like your application <laughs> to no, I like your application to to uh, to conversations. I I think to be practical. Uh, what I try to do is is to get leaders to be willing to have conversations in spaces that aren't that far from home, right? To see to see the joy in it, and then point out the exciting things that we found uh, on that journey. Mm. Um, I also try to model the behavior myself, right? Which is which is to to simply refuse to come uh, to a a client meeting with a, a a firm view of where I need this meeting to have have gotten to, so that I can at least uh, kind of illustrate it. Mm. As you know, I used to I used to be a, a monitor company in the in the olden days, and and I did an an odd thing with with uh, my case teams, which sort of freaked them out, but. Uh, it, it was what it was because I came to the conclusion that it stilts a conversation with the client when you get too many logical steps ahead of them, right? So, so any kind of work on any project is uh, a long, long set of logical steps where you start with sort of a uh, what, what do we do here and build a way of thinking about it, add data. Da, da, da. It's many logical steps that finally get you to say, you know, I think we should do. Uh, X, and typically consultants, you know, get that problem. They do maybe interact with clients some, but then kind of are inclined to go away. They like being in their in their own office talking among themselves, and in that process of talking, they go many logical steps. Mm. So let's just say it's twenty logical steps to get to the answer. They go eight, then they go to the client and present the the conclusions they're at, and the client is like, "Well, I don't know about that." I don't know, da, 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 da. Well, it's because they didn't go through those eight logical steps. Now, consultants, many of whom are too arrogant for their own uh, good, sort of say, well, it's because they're not as smart as we are, Mm -hmm. Uh, right? But no, they just didn't have a chance to go through the eight steps. They could have gone through the eight steps and, and, and been right there beside you, ready to go figure out what's nine and 10 and, and the like. Because of this, I banned thinking away from the client. Right, I said, I you are banned from thinking about the project 
when you're not with the client. None. No, no meetings are allowed uh, back, at, back at the office. I don't even want thinking. I don't want slide writing. I don't want memo writing. That's all away from the client. We must do it with the client. And that, mm. that sort of freaked, freaked them out because they're <laughs> like, but then we won't be ahead of the client, right? <laughs> and so then they'll think we're stupid. And of course, this is a model. We were talking about models mm -hmm. earlier. The model is, unless we're ahead of the client, they will think less of us. You're enforcing a real conversation. Yeah, yeah. And instead, they think so much more of you. They say, gosh, this is great. I, li I like you. You guys are really smart. What I love about this example as well is that you brought in quite, quite a simple rule, quite an easy to understand rule that then uh, shapes what is to follow. Um, how long did it take? Because you, you said in the first year, yeah. they tried to slip in more slides. So how long did it take? And, and what were some of the tricky parts? Sure. Uh, two years. I would, say, I would say we did this for 2001 cycle. And I would say it wasn't until 2003 that people were, had, had sort of calmed down. They, they, they worried that there would be some kind of a gotcha, right? Because there was more gotchas before when you were coming in seemingly perfect, right? Uh, if something was wrong, then the senior people would, would, be, would be inclined to say, listen, uh, like I just don't agree with you. So it was gotcha. Um, so they were still worried about gotcha. Uh, they were still worried that they would be perceived as not having things buttoned up. And unless you had things buttoned up, you wouldn't be, you know, kind of promotable to the, ne to the next level. So I would say it took, it took about, uh, about two years. But the interesting thing to me is how sticky it's been. So when they got over that hump, they just liked it a whole lot more. Mm. Uh, and it's continued to this, to this day. So when you sort of free people up from having to engage in something that is sort of more unnatural than natural, I think it's then hard to go back to, uh, to set piece. Um, but it took a while. So you've been working deeply with integrative thinking and the whole idea about prototyping. So did you did you need to install new capabilities for all these leaders to be able to work in a new way and 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 own a new language for how to engage? That's a. I mean, there's sort of a yes and no to that. To to that. So so um, a key was ag who is, is sort of <laughs> big time brilliant on a, on a bunch of dimensions. Um, and, and he and I had talked a lot before doing this about the concept of integrative thinking, though I wouldn't say he, I ever like taught him that we just, we just sort of hung, hung, hung out, uh, t uh, together. Um, I think it's, it's improved. Uh, by sort of uh, an adoption of, of integrative thinking as, as if you will, a mindset, mm. right? Which is, and, and the very, very core that I say of integrative thinking is, is simply uh, being able to say to yourself when somebody disagrees fundamentally with your point of view, to have the first thing that comes to your mind is interesting. What must they be seeing that I don't see as opposed to, uh oh, uh oh, we got a disagreement here. We got a problem, right? If instead it's it, it's intrigue, mm. uh, then you're away to the races. Like everything after intrigue comes more naturally than not. The challenge is getting to intrigue. Like hmm, because the the tr the true integrative thinker at his or her best is saying, okay person has had different life experiences that have gathered different data that I've never seen that he or she has seen, or that person has a different thinking process. We may have similar data, but that person has processed the data in a different way to come up with a different solution. I have to have that, or, I'm, or my answer is going to suck. And by the way, he or she should have what's in mind because mine is obviously different than, than his or hers because, because we've come to a different, uh, different point of view. So let's figure out how to get both of those uh, out. If you have that as your, your goal, what I say that is that's mining difference, right? It's viewing it like a gold mine. It's like difference is a gold mine. And what you want to do is mine it for everything it's got as opposed to difference. 
is a problem. It's just flat out a problem. We gotta we gotta get rid of this difference by me crushing it. Yeah, yeah. If you can somehow define your strategy process as a series of conversations, yeah, and then you 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 design those conversations and you create a space for real conversation, that's when you can create something magical. Yeah. If it gets a little bit rigid and 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 you know these faces and so forth, sometimes you lose it a little bit to the format and you end up thinking that strategy is a is a slide deck. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Strategy masquerading as a slide deck. There's a lot of that that goes on in the world. Yes. Thank you, Roger. Thanks for having me. I always love doing stuff with Implement. What are we going to take away from this conversation? Steve? Oh, there, there, I think there was a lot. Thanks to you, Roger. Um, for me, the big one is that reminding oneself that strategy is a creative process of imagining the future. And my own experience is that very rarely strategy processes feels like that. Uh, so that's a big reminder. And then also this asking myself, how, how, how curious am I to outliers and to why are people reasoning differently than I am? Am I really curious? I think a lot of us are losing our curiousness uh, over time. Uh, we know so much, right? Uh, so this was a good reminder. Thank you, Roger. Yeah. And I think what I'll be taking away is he, he talked about this example where everybody thought the conversation sucked, but they thought that the other people didn't think it sucked. And I think that's just a really great invitation that if you think a conversation sucks, challenge it. So I'll be taking that with me. And uh, thank you very much for today. And thanks for listening, everyone.